Uh, good morning and good afternoon. We're really happy to have Professor Temple Grandin um, join us for this uh, event and chat. So we'll be talking about uh, creating supportive neurodiverse environments. Dr. Grandin is a world renowned is world renowned for trailblazing work as a advocate and spokesperson for people with autism um, and her pioneering work with uh, animal behavior. She is a professor of animal science at Colorado State University and has had a long and amazing career uh, consulting on livestock handling, design, animal welfare is the subject of many books. Um, I really like the autistic brain, different, not less thinking in pictures, uh, visual thinking is a great book. And um, her well, life story you. is, yes, visual, uh, visual thinking is an excellent book. And she was also the subject of a 2010 HBO film called Temple Grandin, which is a great film, and I recommend it for everyone. Um, that's enough out of me. So I will turn it over to Temple Grandin. Uh, we're so happy to have you with us. So thank you for joining us today. Well, I think I'll do a pretty short introduction. And uh, one of the places where we have a lot of problems is the transition from school to work. And that is something that needs to be gradual. Uh, my first formal work experience, my mother set up when I was 13, just in the home of a seamstress. I took apart dresses and I hand hemmed them for her. That was just done in the neighborhood. Or maybe the kid could do a church volunteer job <coughs> or volunteer at a nursing home or at a farmer's market where they're doing a task on a schedule outside the family. Because work skills are very, very different than um, academic skills. And I'm seeing too many individuals graduating from high school and they've never gone shopping. They've never ordered food in a restaurant. Everything has been done for them. And uh, that doesn't make for a good outcome. So a gradual transition. So it's not sudden. Now, I've been doing a lot of talks. And when it comes to accommodations at work, I, I want to talk about specific things that come up all the time. The first thing is let's avoid the chaotic multitask, rapid multitasking jobs like a McDonald's takeout window. But I can give you an example I just heard about within the last year of how a local McDonald's manager just made a good accommodation for an autistic uh, cashier. When the restaurant got really busy, they moved her off the register and onto the cleaning tables. See, that was just a very simple accommodation that worked. Now, the other thing that absolutely does not work is long yakety yak yak verbal instruction. That does not work. And any task that involves a sequence, you need to make a pilot's checklist. And if the boss challenges you on that, you need to say, pilots need a checklist, I need one too. I want that to become a new saying because this could save a lot of jobs. Just in the last few months, I heard a sad story of a man, a young autistic man who lost two electrician apprenticeships because the boss would go yak, 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 and then he did all the stuff wrong. If they had taken two minutes to just write down, okay, light fixture to this dimmer switch, you know, a list of the things and, and the order that they wanted them installed, the job wouldn't have been lost. And this has come up over and over again. Uh, and you have some jobs where it might be um, uh, closing out the Walmart's cash register right down the steps. And then there's other jobs where the things you do each day are different, like the electrician apprenticeship job. And then you would need a new pilot's checklist each day. Tyler, I'd really appreciate it if you put your camera on. I do not like talking to myself. If you could put your camera on, I'd really appreciate it. I like okay. seeing people. So that is, is um, um, some of the really important things on jobs. Now, the other thing is I've written about the different kinds of minds in both my new book, Visual Thinking, which does have a British edition, and um, my older book, The Autistic Brain. I am an object visualizer. Everything I think about is a picture. And I'm very concerned that my kind of mind's getting screened out of the educational system. I can't do higher math. And neither could all the shop people I worked with that were inventing mechanically complicated equipment or the food processing industry, patenting it and selling it around the world. So the object visualizers that are terrible at things like algebra, we're good at art, working with animals, photography. I'm now seeing a lady that I met at a horse show with two gigantic cameras 
and she's uh, taking pictures of people's horses and, and has a really good business where she could buy those fancy cameras. And then finally, mechanics. Art and mechanics, they go together. There's been individuals addicted to video games where they introduced auto mechanics and it led to jobs. Five or six case histories where that's been successful. And they found motors were more interesting than video games. So that's my kind of mind. Mechanical, art, photography, animals. Then you have another kind of autistic person, the mathematician. You know, half the programmers that made this computer and all the stuff we're using right now possible, probably on the autistic spectrum. They think in patterns, not pictures, patterns, music, math, programming, chemistry, physics. And then you've got your word thinkers. And there's some autistic people that are really into words, uh, learning languages, uh, love history and sports statistics, things of this sort. And, and one of the big problems we have on looking at things like accommodations is the verbal thinkers that run education overgeneralize. Well, we got to give accommodations. But you see, my mind thinks in specific examples and the need for the pilot's checklist. That has come up over and over and over and over again. And I got to thinking about um, what I would have to do to learn a job like gate agent at the airport. I was at a big training conference. Well, I want to not use the yucky meatpacking plant examples and something everybody can relate to. There's like 12 different things that gate agent has to do on that computer. Okay, gate check a bag, print a boarding pass and assign a seat. Okay, make a list like that. Now, if somebody just goes like that, I can't remember that. I've watched them do it many times. I can't remember the keystrokes. What I'd have to do is when it's not busy, get an experienced person say, okay, gate check a bag, write down the keystrokes, uh, print a boarding pass and assign a seat, the keystrokes, I'd have to write them down. And then I'd have to take them home and practice them. That's what I would have to do if I had to do that job. But I'll tell you what I'll be good at. Frozen jet bridges at the Denver airport, I'm gonna make that problem go away. You see, that's where my kind of mind can excel. I've been on planes where uh, you know, they sprayed a de-icing truck all over it. I can tell you that did not work. I got sat there and watched that. Uh, they, you see, this is where they, my kind of mind can sell. I can figure out what makes a jet bridge get frozen and, and prevent it from happening. But something like the job on the computer, I, I cannot learn that with yak, 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 somebody just tapping out the keystrokes really fast. That's not gonna work for me. And that's what I'd have to do if I had to do that gate agent job today. And that's a much simpler job than a ticket agent that really has to know the program. That they have to know a whole lot more stuff. So I'm just using those as examples and that's something that people can relate to. And it wouldn't take that long for somebody for me to make my checklist. And then I'd go home, I'd probably make up advertising jingles and songs for the different keystrokes. So I could remember that. Like, uh, okay, we have a thing now at school where I have to put uh, my students uh, uh, travel expenses on something called account 64. Now I'm thinking of this song about the world according to Garp, ho, 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 when I'm 64. And that's how I'm gonna remember that. And that's happening right now, I've got to remember that account number. Now I'm seeing this little baby flying up in the air and it's really cute beginning of this movie and hearing that song. Well, what I'd like to do now is um, let's just get some good chat going because this is where we can really talk about the good stuff. But yeah, <clears throat> I'm, I'm uh, uh, these are just some of the things that just come up all the time where I talk to many people and these are simple accommodations. They can just make all the difference in the world. And, I, and, and I, the gate agent thing, I'm, I was in a big giant training conference for training people a couple of months ago. And I need something a little more complicated than setting the cash register at Walmart. And I said, they were talking about inclusive training. So let's say for that gate agent job, okay, one way you can train is just watch the keystrokes. Some people can do that. I can't. Uh, a video showing it. Uh, one of those old fashioned computer books on how to use Windows. And then my way of doing it. 
making checklist for each set of keystrokes for the different functions. So that's four different ways that we could train people to do the computer part of a gate agent at the airport. And, and so maybe that's inclusive training. Well, I can think of four different ways. And the first method, okay, the person just shows me the keystrokes. And this has happened on a lot of jobs. I said, look, I showed you how to do that like four times. Are you stupid? You can't remember that simple thing? No, I've got no working memory. No, I've got a very, very slow, very small processor, but I've got gigantic uh, uh, visual memory storage, gigantic. See, the like first step, and I tell bosses, is you have to realize people think differently. I'm also going to tell them, you need the skills of my kind of mind. Yeah, you get a frozen jet bridge, it takes an hour, that's an hour delay. I've been on that plane several times. That's where you need my kind of mind. And I'm seeing how they telescope and I can see where the water could go down in there and freeze. See, I see that. I can fix that for you. I think these are good examples. And then like Temple said, um, now is a great time for us to just chat. And we've got a great- That's what I want, that's what I want to do is yeah. because I'm interested in, in real practical things. Accommodations get talked about in too vague a way. I'll give you an example. I had a PhD student call me up. She was getting a PhD in vocational rehab and um, uh, an autistic man lost a job at a store. And they just said vaguely, well, they didn't give him accommodations. And I'm going, all right, what was the problem? You know what the problem was? A certain Christmas carol playing on the, on the store's uh, loudspeaker mm. like it was, had caused a sensory problem. Why don't we just take it off the playlist? You know, you've got to get in there and and that's another one, real recent. All this stuff I'm telling you right now is real recent stuff. Well, or, or he put the headphones on or he can turn it off or something. But you see what annoys the merchants is they say, well, we'll take that autistic person out and give you another one. And the shopkeeper's going, I don't want to train another person. Mm -hmm. You see that annoys the merchants. I'm interested in that example you mentioned about the McDonald's one, because I think that was a good example about when, when things are getting busy and then moving that person off of That's the register. Exactly did. How did that happen? Was that just a manager who had uh, unusually good judgment or was there training or something? No, there was no training. It was just a manager that had some good common sense. Okay. A hmm. local McDonald's manager did that. Hmm. I mean, it, it, this didn't involve any training or anything like that. And they would take her off the register like at the lunch rush when the restaurant got super busy. And because the tables have to be cleaned when the restaurant's super busy. And they just had her clean tables instead of running a register. Well, and that's a real case that happened within the last six months or so, real recent. I, I, again, my mind thinks in specific examples. I don't think in generalities, but the things with the um, working memory, long strings of verbal instruction, oh, that's come up like probably 50 times. They'll need for the pilot's checklist. I guess <clears throat> that is one of our goals with this current BBC project is how can we put people in the best positions to succeed and do their job and, um, you know, make the best of their talent. So that's come up uh, on the Cambridge side, on the BBC side in terms of like, how do we improve these sort of things? And I guess why I asked that question about the McDonald's one is like, how do we tell people to know these things to like, you know, the people who make decisions in terms of who does, does what and when and what kind of work? Um, how do we do that? How do we kind of like build that into more of like the the kind of thinking that happens rather than, oh, this person is stupid or this person can't follow instructions? Well, I've heard, I've heard that? bosses complain about that. Well, I already showed them how to use the fry machine like five mm -hmm. times. It's stupid. Well, yeah. this is something where they need to write down the steps. And if they wrote down the steps or something, okay, for a task you do eventually, they probably get rid of the checklist because they mm -hmm. videotape it into their mind. But in the beginning, and then something like the gate agent, I don't really want to pull a checklist out in front of passengers, be embarrassed. And I would practice that at home. And I probably would make little jingles and things for gate check a bag, if whatever, you know, from the letters on the keys or something to help. And I'd have to put some effort into that at home for that job. Now the Walmart thing, I would just have the checklist in my pocket. I wouldn't care if they saw it. And the, uh, the, but you uh, see, the thing is people have to ask for an accommodation, right? But 
I would say, some people don't want to disclose. I'd say pilots need a checklist. I need one too. Now, the regulations in the U.S. by the Federal Aviation Administration, I'm reminded the boss of this, pilots do it every single commercial flight. They do it. It's not optional. And that's the way, if I don't want to disclose, that I would handle over the bus. I want a new saying for um, people who need that accommodation. Pilots need a checklist. I need one too. Mm -hmm. And if you look up the checklist and you look it up for small airplane, they, they, they're not like, it's like one to three words for each item to just jog the memory. That it's not like three sentences for each item, just enough to jog the memory of what the next step is. Got a uh, common this, this would save a ton of jobs. Uh, Eve Marie, if you don't mind, I'm I'm going to read this. Um, I think I think this is a good point that people I think that people have to know themselves first in order to be able to ask for the right accommodation. And I guess this kind of goes temple with what you're talking about with the disclosure and how do you even know that you need the 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 things to ask for in order to do your job well? So that's a question. Well, if you say I need a pilot's checklist. Because pilots need a checklist. I need one too. I'm not disclosing. I don't, that's not disclosing. Hmm. And then Julia. Uh, hi, Julia. Um, you also agree employers need to anticipate that people have different ways of learning and incorporate universal design for learning principles from the very start. I think that is key. Uh, that way, there are different ways of accessing the information from the very start. So, well, this is where when I was at the training conference, and it was a train. It was a whole session on inclusive training. So let's go back to the gate agent because I want to pick a computer job a bit more complicated than the uh, than Walmart uh, cash register. And and I said, okay, now the first way it would be trained is the other gate agent just go boom, 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 boom. This is how you check a bag. And some people can learn it. So I'm gonna just call that verbal and they see the keystrokes. Goes too fast for me, can't remember it. You know, then maybe there's a video that shows it. Then there's an old fashioned Microsoft, you know, uh, the dummies type of book. And then there's my way where the keystrokes for each thing the gate agent has to do are written down in the list. Print a boarding pass, gate check bag, change a seat. There's like 12 things they have to do. It's not 100 for a gate agent, at least at our airports. And I'm using uh -huh. that as an example because it's something that I can tell you everybody at that conference said, was certainly familiar with. So and so forth. So now I have four different ways I could teach that job, just the computer part of it. And how about anyone else? Uh, since we've got a good mix of uh, Cambridge BBC and other guests here, anyone else like to chime in and share any examples or questions for Temple? So uh, let's make good use of our, our 41 minutes uh, left together, see if we have any thoughts or the ideas. The other thing, I've done a lot of talks to businesses, lots of talks. And one of the things that heads of businesses will ask me is, um, how do you know uh, that they have to realize that different thinking exists? I didn't know that other people did not think in pictures until I was late 30s. I didn't know that verbal thinking existed. And I discussed that in my visual thinking book. So I tell bosses, the first thing is you have to realize different thinking exists. And the visual thinkers like, like me are good at all the mechanical things. And you need our skills. And maybe we're too, we can't do higher math, but you want that airplane fixed. We're the ones that are going to do it. Or keep the water system working in your building, in the high-rise building. You're going to need people like me. And let's look at how different minds can have complementary skills. Let's take the iPhone, for example. Steve Jobs was an artist. And he made an interface that was easy to use. The mathematical engineers had to make that phone work. There were the two Steves, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak on the very first uh, Macintosh computer. That's complementary minds working together. We're on Zoom with an easy to use interface. That's not designed by the mathematician. They'll get them too complicated. You see, you need to have the different kinds of minds. In the food processing plant, my kind of minds would be in the shop making all this and patenting a whole lot of uh, complicated equipment and the mathematical engineers doing boilers and refrigeration. So you need to have both. 
And then there's some mixtures. There's a lot of people that are mixtures of the different kinds of minds. But then there's people like me that might be an extreme object visualizer or the other person is an extreme mathematician. And some people are mixtures. And the thing is, it kind of gets back to what you're good at. My kind of mind's terrible at algebra. I don't think I graduate from high school today. And I think that's a real serious issue. Um, you can't usually tell in three-year-olds, but around six, seven, eight, kids good at math, you need to move them ahead. Um, I think one of the worst things that some of our schools did was taking out all the hands-on classes. And what's happening now, our school is putting them back in. This just came out a week ago, in the local <laughs> paper. But the what? bad thing that happened, and I talked to a special ed teacher at a, and she told me that they didn't want to let the autistic kids take shop because they're worried about tool safety. That's rubbish because usually autistic individuals are very fussy about rules. They'll probably be some of the safest people using the saws. We got a couple of comments here, good comments. So I'm just going to read a few okay. of them. Uh, Maggie, it can be hard to convince an employer about val the value of investing extra time and getting to know someone in their way of working. Um, true. Yeah, I think so. How to how to how to make it not feel that people are spending extra time, employers in particular, um, doing this, but making them understand it is an investment that we can get more out of people by doing the hard work up front. Um, is a challenge. Well, well, the thing with a checklist only takes a couple of minutes. Okay, let's go back to the electrical apprentice. It would take like two minutes for him to write down a list of the different light fixtures uh, they were going to install that day and what you wire, what switch gets wired to what light fixture. That would only take a couple of minutes. You see, for a lot of people on the training, this checklist thing, uh, there's a lot of jobs where that's really going to work and it's not time consuming. Now, if you go in there and you say, now, this is how you do the keystrokes. Well, you're going to, the bosses are just going to get mad then. But if you write them down, it can be done quickly. And the other thing is, is um, the way I you see, I worked as freelance on designing cattle facilities. Okay, the way I got jobs is I simply showed off my drawings. I showed off my work. And I met a lady at this horse show with two big cameras. Well, she got the money to buy those fancy cameras, take pictures of expensive horses. And she made it into a really good business. Photography. And that's something where she just shows off her portfolio. And then somebody owns a horse, goes, oh, you should take a picture of my horse. And then that turns into good business. See, some very successful people have their own businesses. It's the same thing with metalworking shops. It started with one welding class. See, and I'm thinking more of my kind of mind. Or let's say somebody's a programmer. Well, first of all, in high school, that kid should have been moved way ahead in math. Way, way, way ahead in math. And often that's not done. But I tell the bosses, if you want the uh, water system to work in this fancy office you've got, you're going to need the autistic brain. It's that simple. We've got a um, related to that. So Eve Marie's got a comment or a question here. Um, how do we know what type of brain we have? Uh, I know I'm a visual thinker and really good with patterns, but is it a visual thinking brain? And she well, there's, two, there's two kinds of visual thinking. There's object visualizers like me. And there's a whole chapter in the visual thinking book on the science behind the different kinds of thinking. I think in photorealistic pictures. Now, there's other people that think patterns. That's a different type of visual thinking. This is the more mathematical type of visual thinking. They think patterns instead of photorealistic pictures. That's your main difference. And... And again, the kind of things that tend, my kind of mind tends to be good at animals, photography, art, and mechanics. The pattern thinker is good at math, lots of times programming, uh, physics, chemistry, music, music and math go together with a pattern thinker. These are common patterns that I've seen over and over and over again. So this is actually two kinds of visual thinking. And the mistake that's made in a lot of the research is they're being mixed together. 
and mm. that is wrong. Hmm. That's a good point. Um, David has a great comment here. Hi, David. Thank you for joining us. Uh, not knowing what you need is a great point. I wonder if it would be useful for certain roles to have those different types, different styles of instruction at the beginning stage of recruitment to see if uh, a candidate is suitable. I've created step-by-step -step instructions with pictures in some of my roles to make it easier for me and some of my colleagues. That's great. That's very interesting. Well, you see, and this is where, you know, then something with these pictures on the gate, the, um, okay, what else, let's go back to the keystroke thing. Uh, for, let's say, gate check a bag, I would just, you know, put down a, I would just write down a list of the keystrokes. And then for that job, I'd have to take it home and practice it. I'd say, well, let me take this home and practice it. Mm -hmm. We'll come back tomorrow. I'd be spending several hours practicing at home. I mm -hmm. on my own keyboard, probably not actually push the keys, but I would. I don't want to mess up my computer, but I. That's what I would do with that. But how long would it? Wouldn't take that long to write them down. And this is something that for autistic people comes up all the time. This is the, the working memory. No working memory. No working memory for verbal yakety yak 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 long strings of verbal instruction. This comes up all the time. It's one of the most common accommodations that we need. Also, let's talk about some sensory stuff. LED lights that flicker. That is a problem for some people. So now what do you do if you got a workstation with those horrible lights and you can't get rid of them? Well, the way you can tell the bad lights and the good lights is take some slow motion video with your camera and then wave. And you got to play it back in slow motion. And you hmm. can find the bad lights by taking slow motion video with a high end phone. Then, if you're stuck in an office with this, you got to go buy a lamp and you got to find an LED that does not flicker, a real bright one. You put that in the lamp and that will blot out the light. And you just go do that. I'm always trying to figure out simple things. Um, you know, when it comes to kids and noise sensitivity, um, if the child controls the sound, like turning the hairdryer and the vacuum cleaner on and off, they can often better tolerate it. And then, of course, there's noise canceling headphones. I, I saw a lot of people in computer companies, and I've been to their offices, headphones, a whole uh, you know, bunch of cubicles, and everybody's got headphones clapped on their heads. Uh, they're already doing that accommodation. Some people might need sensory breaks to chill out and calm down. Julie has a very interesting question here. Um, uh, welcome, Julie. Do you want to read this question aloud? Otherwise, I can read it to you, whatever you prefer. Um, I think this is a great one to share. Oh, sorry, you're on mute. I'm uh, reading it right now. I'm reading. I'm assuming everybody else has got the chat up and reading it. And I so. Um, and I'm... Uh, one of the things I learned to do very uh, early was to show my work off. The way an interview for me was put the drawings on the table. Now they'd be on a computer and I'd show them on the, on the computer. But basically showing the work. Okay, I did a, um, okay, how can you, we need to change some of these interviewing process. Let's say I'm hiring mechanics. Maybe the thing that you'd be looking at is, a, is an older car that they restored. And I'm, I've talked to a lot of people about how to make portfolios. And I have a lot of parents that get so stuck into the autism. They tell me their kid's good at art, but they don't um, uh, have their kid's art on the phone to sell a commission. Because you know how you make money in art? You have to sell commissions. That's how you make money. And they don't think to sell a commission for their kid. And that's where you make money in art. You know, I still, there's one lady I know, she does beautiful pencil drawings of people's pets. Those are worth about 400 bucks a piece in a nice frame. <laughs> People will pay for those. You can make a living doing that. And they don't think to put their kids' art or something like that on their phone to show people. They get so much into the autism, they don't think about what the kid can do. Because where people with autism have been successful at their own businesses. Now, when I was in my 20s, um, Jim Ool, a contractor, 
help me set my business up. Uh, people on the spectrum are going to need help if they want to do their own business. And unfortunately, today, it's much more complicated now than it is in, was in the 70s. Um, like in my business, I have to have a professional accountant. You know, it's the only way I can, you know, and, you know, you've got to have, uh, you know, how do you, how do you deduct the, the, the expenses correctly? How do you do this record and that record? And it's getting more and more and more complicated. I think um, just to address Julie's point too, that question of that, that topic of role models is something um, I've been thinking about more too in terms of like university, BBC, other organizations. Um, it is really valuable. It's valuable that we're doing this together right now to hear some of your tips and uh, the, the slow motion video thing um, is great. Um, that wouldn't have occurred to me in a million years, but it was like, yeah, little things like that to kind of show, um, even just for people to hear the different strategies that others have evolved that have been successful, I think, is a valuable message. And I think it's something we just want to try to do more of and more of at a larger scale if we can. Well, and I had a student walk up to me just the other day in the parking garage. And she said that I had inspired her. Hmm. I'm really glad I ran into her in the parking garage. Hmm. Uh, because I uh, sort of like, if I can do it, you know, she can do it too. Yeah. And and the thing is, I want to figure out simple accommodations where the person just brings the lamp in from home and has a light in it. Let's see, if I if I can't get rid of the lights in the office and there's no windows, I have to blot that horrible light out with a brighter light that will kind of override it, that doesn't flicker. I just bring the lamp in and put it next to my desk. I wouldn't even ask. I would just do it. And it's a, if it's a reasonable lamp, there shouldn't be any problem. And I think a lot of these are little things that, you know, a lot of little things that add up and some of the pushback that we've seen with companies um, in an ideal world, companies would be very interested in investing the time to, you know, carefully think through these things, make checklists. Um, we've also had examples where people, uh, organizations and decision makers have said is like, well, we can't really afford to do this right now. And our response tends to be, you can't afford not to do this in terms of getting the most out of your talent and your people. Um, Rachel's got a related comment that I want to read out for everyone. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you for joining us again. Um, good question here. A lot of recruit uh, recruitment practices seem to be biased towards consistently recruiting people with the same types of thinking and processing styles as the recruiters uh, prefer people like them, leading to a lack of diversity. I think that's true. When a different yeah. type of th uh, thinker sneaks through, they are perceived as other or a problem. How do we challenge, um, you know, this sort of people recruiting people who are like them kind of uh, phenomenon? I think that's I great. Think, I think that's a very big problem. And one of the things I learned when I would show off my drawings, I didn't show them to the HR department. I showed them to the plant manager. I showed them to the plant engineering department. I showed them to the people that would appreciate the drawings. Um, you know, I think we have to do some things on, on changing some of these recruiting practice okay for my kind of mind um you need you need uh you know my kind of thinkers i i say to the bosses you need our skills i said we wouldn't even have this computer any of this stuff we've got right now if it wasn't for some people on the autism spectrum and i emphasize in this book that we need the skills you see, in the first step, and I've done a lot of talks to big corporations, lots of them, all kinds. Steel said, you want to keep your mill running? You're going to need people like me. Why don't you go check out your shop? I bet you they're all turning gray like me, and they're not getting replaced. I've talked to travel companies, airlines, a lot of banks. In fact, one place where the verbal kind of autistic person does really well is sales of specialized financial products things I don't even understand. They've also done really well in selling cars because they'll know every car on the lot. That's another place where um, people on the spectrum have been very successful. You see, you don't have the multitasking. It, car dealerships are relatively quiet and you're working with one customer at a time. And that has worked well. Uh, the first step I tell the bosses is you have to realize different thinking exists. I didn't know. The verbal thinking existed until I was in my late 30s. I didn't know. 
that's the thing I find. You have to, this is why I did this, this book. And this is aimed at businesses. Hmm. David, I just had an idea. What if we did a BBC book club with visual thinking? Um, oh, that would be great. Hidden yeah. gifts of people who think in pictures, patterns, and abstractions. Because yeah, I'm yeah. concerned right now about skill loss, especially for my kind of mind that can't do algebra. I think one of the reasons why the schools push algebra is they think you need it for logical thinking. I don't think that way. And one of the things we what's happening at home is people like fix elevators. They're all turning gray. And I've been on some very questionable elevators in the last year that have not been serviced. Mm. Like skipping a floor, scraping in the shaft, doors not working right. That's all in the last year I've experienced that. It's funny you had mentioned the uh, the car sales uh, example too, because I had a um, this event. I had a picture of you on my computer, and a friendly guy at the coffee shop started talking to me um, about baseball. He had a, an amazing memory for baseball stats because uh, yeah. we're both baseball fans, and he remembered yeah. the pitch count and the date of the game. I was like, God, I thought I had a good baseball memory, but um, I asked him what he did for a living. He's like, Oh, I sell cars, and then you know he he was able to say, "It's like this is how many cars we have on the lot. We have this many." uh new ones and used ones i was like wow he is like the he has the perfect mind for that role well you and, see but that's you know, something that can be a really decent job and car dealerships are not chaotic multitasking they're pretty quiet so for the more verbal type of autistic that likes history and facts and sports statistics car sales might be a really good thing for them to be in Um, we've got a few more questions. Uh, Ilif has a question here or a comment. Similar to Temple, I did not know until I was 30 that not everyone thought in visuals. In exams, for example, uh, Ilif is a PhD student at uh, Cambridge, by the way, I'd remember uh, the answers to exam questions by recalling where exactly I wrote the relevant information in my notebook. I could not recreate the information in my brain if I did not remember along with which visuals uh, I learned. So that's why algebra was such a tough, tough subject, whereas geometry was easy in comparison. I'm seeing that pattern showing up all the time where mm. the geometry is easier. It's, it's sort of like the pilot's checklist thing. It's something, the need for that just comes up all the time. And, and I'm worried right now, like in some of the schools, when I was doing a book tour for visual thinking last October, you know, just last year, I, we did a talk in a school because the bookstore didn't have enough room. And I talked to the principal. He didn't even know that my kind of thinking existed. I'm going, this is a big concern. And um, you like the air conditioning to work in this school in the summertime? I think you would. You need the people that are terrible at algebra. Hmm. Um, Tiffany's got a, I'm trying to get through everyone's comments and questions. Yeah, well, let, yeah let's do that. Uh, Tiffany has an adult daughter with autism. She's mostly nonverbal except for concrete concepts. Uh, my daughter requires uh, that the fan remain on all day. I can't determine whether she likes the sound of the fan or is trying to drown out another sound. It'd be complicated. Well, she yeah. might be trying to drown out another sound with the fan. Hmm. That's, that's, that's possible. She might be trying to do that. Um, related to sound, uh, Julie uh, is an educational psychologist, and the most inclusive thing really about the environment from the start, uh, uh, sorry, thinking about uh, the environment and being inclusive with accommodations for all. Examples include, like you mentioned, noise canceling headphones, yep. fairy lights rather than main lights. That's interesting. Um, uncluttered space, clear spaces, places for objects, and permission to listen in different ways. Um, not having to look people in the eyes, walking around the classroom. Um, those are really good examples of accommodation. Yeah. Um, and uh, more from Julie. I'm just going to keep reading these, Julie. Um, oh, Julia Hayes. Sorry. Hey, Julia. Long time no see. Um, so Julia works as a visual illustrator at conferences and events, and large companies like Google regularly use visual recorders uh, to both facilitate, illustrate, and facilitate events um, as part of the day. That's true. I think there are companies that play uh, uh, place value on the visual when it comes to adding to team planning and implementation. Um, that's a good point. So we're actually no, going. That's to a really that's a really good point. And the other thing, um. There's a, yeah, what, what, let's talk about another thing about, you know, meat equipment. You know, we, I've been in this industry for 50 years. 
And about 15 years ago, uh, we had to start importing specialized equipment for processing poultry and pigs. It's all coming out of Holland. And that's paying the price for taking skilled trades out. And there's a tendency of people, oh, we need to go to college, stick the nose up at skilled trades. Well, the thing that the people, the, the visual thinkers that work in the shop, it's a different kind of thinking that the verbal thinkers just don't understand. They just see how a machine works. And even though our school district is, you know, putting these classes back in, um, I gave a talk at a gifted conference and um, I, one of the parents didn't want their kid taking any Votech classes, found out maybe they're afraid they might like them. And then I was doing a Zoom call with a high school that had an animal science to, you know, uh, program. And this girl comes up, they had come up to the computer to ask a question. I remember this girl's coming up, looming into the computer going, my guidance counselor said, I shouldn't take any Votech classes. That's two weeks ago. That's right now. Hmm. And um, I worked with a lot of people in the shops. And they, it's, 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 some people would say, well, stupid kids take shop. No, it's a different kind of intelligence. I'm talking real high-end skilled trades. I'm not talking about roofing and laying down road tar. I'm talking about the real high-end stuff where people are inventing mechanical devices and patenting them. And most of them have not graduated, barely graduated from high school. I've worked with those people. And, and we need those skills. Who's going to fix elevators? You see, and for my kind of mind, um, that would be a good job. You know, there's a lot of people who go, well, everything's run by a computer. Wait a minute. An elevator is a mechanical device run by a computer. It's still mechanical. You either have cables or if they're just a few floors, a hydraulic thing that lifts them up and down. That's a mechanical device. The computer may control it, but it's still a mechanical device. In that topic of, um, I mean, as a as a teacher who worked in schools myself, um, that that example you gave about um, kids being told what they should and shouldn't take. Um, there's a lot of work to do in schools and the educational system in general, um, in terms of kind of like people who. Um, they get these messages early on from guidance counselors and teachers in terms that of like was, um, that. that's that a big within question. the last two weeks that I now see her because she had to walk up to the computer and she put her face right in the screen. And because they had to come up to, to talk to me. And mm -hmm. that's what they she said. I'm a believer in in exposing kids to lots of different things. Okay, yeah, I'm seeing kids growing up today that have never done measurements. They've never done tools. I talked to a shop teacher just a week ago, and he told me they have to spend two days now just teaching the kids to do measurement. I was reading something last night where they asked some kids, to, you know, high school students to measure some lines, and they just had no idea of how to do it. We've got a whole bunch of people growing up totally removed from the practical world, and they're going to make policy about stuff like water systems and power electric mm. power uh, that really concerns me um vivian's got a on the topic of the pilot checklist uh, okay. uh a lot of familiar names hi vivian uh i implemented this for an employee with ADS, uh, asd um, in a manual role in one of my previous uh, roles, we keep them available for general reference in times of sensory overload or stress, as we found that manual skills could be compromised temporarily whilst they recovered from sensory overload. Uh, I think that's a good, important okay, fact. Well, I'm glad they found that was helpful because I found that um, I would, okay, let's say I got a job at Walmart, uh, how to log into the cash register, how to close it out, I would write those down. And I would probably need that checklist for a couple of weeks. And then I could probably, for something like that, get rid of it. But then there's other stuff, like the electrician apprentice, where each day we're installing different electrical items. I would need, I would make a pilot checklist every day. I just say to the boss, let me just jot them down on this piece of paper. Take a couple of minutes. It's all. And then I'll make, then I'll follow your directions accurately. Don't even have to disclose. 
when I was designing jobs, we'd have project meetings. We'd be at a beef plant. And, and the, well, the first question is how many cattle per hour? Because you size all your equipment off of that. But let's say it's a remodel job. I have to have very clear boundaries of what part of the building I can tear out. I railroad right away setbacks. I write all this stuff down. And then I make my project fit within those boundaries. I was kind of doing a, a pilot checklist at the at the um, meeting. And then when I've done um, uh, things where real animal welfare guidelines and I'm part of a team, I've just said right in the meeting with 20 other people there, I need a I, I need homework. I'm willing to write this section of the document. That's clearly defined. And then I will write that section of the document. And I just say it in the meeting and then I write it down on a legal pad. That's kind of a pilot's checklist thing. I've been doing that my whole career. And another question. Um, <clears throat> uh, so this one's a little bit different uh, from Eve Marie. Uh, what is your take, Temple, on the double empathy theory where the problematic communication is when an ASD person is talking to a non-ASD person and not just uh, two ASD or two non-ASD people communicating? So when there's a mismatch between uh, people's communication styles. Well, the problem is one thing I had to learn not to do is I might find some subject when I was in high school, carnival rides. And I would just run, talk that subject into, into the ground, just on, 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 on. And so I've learned, you can, I kind of have a rule now, you can tell that story twice and then back off. And, and when I was a little kid, I was taught, you know, I used to go over to the neighbor's house because the teenage girl there would uh, give me pennants and flags and stuff that she was throwing away. And I remember being told, you can't go over there every day. You don't want to wear out your welcome. So I might go there every two months when Ann dejunked her rum. Hmm. Not every day. And how did you I, figure that out? Was it trial I and- I figured that out. And, and um, okay, like, for example, uh, one of our faculty members invited me to Thanksgiving dinner, which would be- uh, but I can't be wanting to go over to their house every day. And there's some people that, um, well, they don't get that. See, this was kind of taught to me. See, this is where 50s upbringing taught a lot of things in a much more structured way. And that's why I'm seeing grandparents that discover they're on the spectrum when the kids get diagnosed. And the grandparents held decent jobs like pharmacist, accountant, engineer a computer programmer, and they have families. I've also, when uh, people on the spectrum get diagnosed later in life, this is the different not less book, they find that that's a relief because then they understand why they've had problems with relationships. You know, you see now things like noise canceling headsets, that's something specific. See, we tend, I was just looking at some of the comments. Um, we tend, there's a tendency for the verbal thinkers to talk way too vague about accommodations. Where, yeah, noise canceling headphones, that comes up all the time. The lighting problem. Well, I can put about, I can like list them in order with the pilot's checklist for learning a job, big number one, and avoid chaotic multitasking is big number two. Uh, and then things like lighting, noise canceling set, headsets, sensory breaks. I can put them on the list. That's what we've tried to do with uh, Think Lab and BBC. We've tried to put as many specific examples as we can, as more like a, I don't know, a recipe book. We know we can't yeah, like yes. uh, think of every single thing, but here are the things to think about. And um, uh, Maggie's got a good point here about the importance of employers looking at the environment as it affects. Hello?
Hello? Hello? Tyler? Hello? Hello? It's okay, you you're back. You, Tampa. Oh, okay, I, the, uh, my, the image froze, so I yeah. logged up before my router went down. Mine too, Temple, mine okay, too. I, I, think... I have to punch out when, when things freeze or I'll lose the router, and that's a 30-minute mess to fix. So that's why I punched out. But, but Tyler just froze. Everything was going fine. I think yeah. Tyler actually dropped out. I can't, I, I think his connection was lost. Oh, maybe it was Tyler's connection that was lost. But I, I um, when things freeze, I've, I've got a little bit of a slow internet connection and I don't want to lose the router. It takes me 30 minutes to reboot it. But okay, we can finish up without Tyler then. I've got another few minutes. Well, we can uh, continue the conversation. No, I think we've had a good a good conversation and we've talked about a whole lot of things that I think were really good. Hello, Temple. Um, I, I noticed that you mentioned sensory breaks. Could you give an example of what sensory breaks looks like? Well, you might go outside and walk around. Okay. Something like that. Go in another okay. room that's quiet. Um, I think the simplest thing is go outside and walk around. Okay. Just something Thank you. simple like that. I like mm -hmm. to keep it very simple, really easy. Well, there's no excuse uh, not to do it. Okay. Um, I know a lady that um, does specialized industrial. Um, she programs things called programmable logic controllers. They control industrial equipment. And every afternoon at four o'clock, um, she goes in a room. She has her own business and lays down in a recliner for 30 minutes just to chill out. Oh, OK. I mean, that's just an example of a, you know, a lot of the tech companies have got like a room where they can go, you know, chill out. Mm. Just something, Thank you. Something simple like that. And then some people find you've got a hat on and some people find that that's helpful with some of the lighting things. So you wear a hat at work. Oh, okay. That's easy. I want to figure out practical, simple things that people can do. And the big number one is the long strings of verbal instruction. Yakety yak, yak, yak does not mm. work. That's big number one. Also vagueness. There was a boy who lost a job at Walmart selling video games, which he should have been good at because Walmart said he was too aggressive with customers. Well, that's too vague. The kid is not gonna know what that means. What you need to do is instruct them and say, you approach a customer once with a video game. And if they're not interested, you back off. Or you might say, now watch Susan, how she approaches a customer. Copy how she does it. That would be an example of giving specific instructions. Being too aggressive with customers, well, they're not going to know what that means. Or you're not a team player. Well, then you, you'd say, well, okay, at the last project meeting we had, you called Jim a stupid jerk. No, that's not okay. And what you do is you, you um, take them aside in private and coach them. In private and coach them. On my very first project, I criticized some welding. And I said it looked like a pigeon had doo-dooed on it. And Harley Winkleman, the plant engineer, took me into his office in the boiler room and explained to me that I had to apologize for that. He told me what I should do in a very straightforward, calm way. And I never used that kind of talk ever again. You see, my mind thinks in specific examples. I don't, you see, top down verbal thinking, really, really top down. That's not how I think. get some more chats up here real quick uh, yeah the host I think um, lost his connection and I punched out briefly because I don't want to risk my router when I saw Tyler freeze yeah oh somebody else had their free their screen frozen I don't know what happened but um if I don't leave the meeting quickly then I have a 30 minute mess to fix so 
Well, the thing is, is that things, you see, lots of times you know, we talked about universal design at this big training conference. Let's take closed captioning on TVs. Every airport and bar is using that now. That's an example of universal design. I saw a delivery person just the other day with a dolly use the wheelchair ramp. That's an example of universal design. So something that was originally, you know, I, I did a, um, a talk at a travel company and we had a whole lot of vague discussion about disabilities. It was all disabilities. And I, my mind thinks specific. And there was a blind person on that committee and he says, you know, what really is bad at the airport is, and they do a lot of plane reservations, this travel thing, is you can't find the gates. So my mind just go gate finder app. And as he walks by the gates, they say their numbers to him. I just made that up. That just popped into my head. Gate finder app, totally doable, totally doable. I just got to figure out which transponder platform to use to so the gates can talk to his phone. Something the airport will not have to maintain to. Might put little solar panels on the transponder so never have to change the batteries. You see, I see that. And I'm talking about solar panels like that big. That's all they need. I, but you see, that's something specific to help the blind person. See that? Um, I hope somebody makes that. I'm, he just said the one thing. He said he had the hardest time when he traveled. Big, long concourses. Now I'm seeing an airport where, you know, you go into the rotunda and you got A, B, C, and D, big, long hallways. Then the phone would say, you are in the rotunda. Go left for the A gates. You know, go in the 10 o'clock position for the B gates. C gates at the 2 o'clock position. Then once you enter the concourse, then it would start just naming them off. A2, A3, whatever it is. I'm just seeing that. Now I can even see different airports, how it would work. So why do I make up airport examples? Well, they're better than yucky meatpacking plant examples. And I spend a lot of time there. Well, you see, this is a good question here from Eva Marie about autism being a deficit. You see, in its mildest forms, I think it's a personality variant. You see, the problem is autism is going from Silicon Valley programmer, a person who runs a company, to somebody who can't dress themselves. We get the same name for it. You now, there's certain things where an extreme mathematician on the autism spectrum, he's got some really great abilities, or she has got some great abilities. And we need the skills. I tell business leaders, we need the skills. I've got a one minute left and I've got to get on my other call right at the top of the hour. Um, but it's been really great being here. And uh, if we take one more really quick question, then I'll have to get off. Thank you, Temple. I don't have a question, but I would definitely love to do the book club with your uh, visual. Well, uh, that's wonderful. I really yeah, appreciate that. And uh, I think I'm going to uh, leave the meeting now. And thank you so much. I've had a great time. All right. Have a good day. Thank you. I will. Okay, great. Thank you so thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay. All right. Bye.